Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to another coffee hour. My name is Paul Abernathy, your host. And if you don't know who I am, Google me for a minute. I serve on Code Making Panel 5 and 17. Uh, I've written numerous articles and publications on the National Electrical Code. And I'm the CEO and founder of Electrical Code Academy Incorporated. And so I wanted to do a quick coffee hour for you today and kind of squirrel some uh, and squash some little things that have been floating around out there that other people have been saying about a recent video that we did called Researching the NEC. And I thought it was interesting because sometimes when you're in this industry and you put out things, um, it doesn't matter whether somebody agrees or disagrees with it. But what happens is they're trying to make a name for themselves on other people. Uh, and then they'll pull other people in here who might have a company that's struggling a little bit. Maybe they don't have the greatest graphics in the world. Maybe they are trying to build something up. So then they latch onto this person and they start doing videos and podcasts. And I usually tell you the person that does these podcasts never has an originalness, originalness to them. Um, they usually have somebody else in it and listening to somebody else. They never give their opinion. They never explain their interpretation of it because they don't want to put themselves out there. I get it. Many people don't. So... I always say, you know, you have to always question the source and validate. And again, when you latch onto an educator whose father was very well known and very well loved, but the person that you're latching onto is not going to keep that legacy going because again, um, they're just trying to get the attention and that's never a good thing. So let's go on and talk about what today's episode is all about. So when you research the NEC, you're going to go back and look at things like public inputs, public comments, and even before that, you're going to look at proposals, and you're going to look at on reports on proposals. You're going to you're going to go look at all of this history, and you'll come to a conclusion based on what the code panel has stated. And then ultimately, the beautiful thing about the NEC is you have to make an interpretation. Now, the key here is to make a safe interpretation because again, this is a safety document, right? It's safeguarding people and property from the use of electricity. So we have to remember that when we're making an interpretation and we're always going to err on the side of caution unless you have some problem with the clarity. And if you have some problem with the clarity, then there's a process for getting the code changed, right? So we encourage you, I encourage you to be a part of the process. If you don't like something in the NEC or you disagree with it and you've been shouting about it for years, do me a favor, get involved. If you need to learn how to get involved, call me. I will show you how to get involved. If you want somebody to help you write a public input in order to have the best chance of being presented in the, in the most technically light, reach out to me. I'm more than happy to assist you with that. Won't charge you a dime. Uh, I do a lot of free consulting for those type of things. I will help you construct it. But you know what? You have to have the basis of substantiation. We, you have to be able to say that it is a well-founded public input. Otherwise, code-making panels are not going to do anything with it. Okay? So think about that when you do it. Just because you don't like something does not mean that you don't follow the code. Let me give you a great example. In the 2023, they're going to be removing the requirement for a receptacle outlet at a peninsula or an island. Okay, I disagree with that because we have a long history of what we've done to try to get a receptacle outlet there. We even came up, the code panel too, came up with a method to do a calculation to make sure that we have enough receptacle outlets there so we can discourage the use of extension cords. Then all of a sudden in the 2023, what we're going to have is now you, you have to have no receptacle outlets at an island or peninsula. But you have to run the circuit there, put it in a junction box, I guess that's what their intent is. So that if somebody down the road wants to add a receptacle outlet, the circuit's already there. Okay, whatever. Um, kind of defeats the purpose for me. I understand what happened there. And that's an example of something that I disagree with. So guess what? I'm going to live with it for the 2023. I can enforce that. But when the 2026 rolls around, do you think I'm going to submit a public input and I'm going to bring up all the history that got us to this point and why we did what we did all those years in order to try to get these receptacle outlets at a peninsula and island. Um, 
Well, you, you bet your tootin' I'm going to. And again, we'll see what happens and the code panel can make their decision. The good news is every three years, you never know how it's going to swing, right? But you have to justify it. Just because I don't like it and I can opine about it and I can say that I disagree with it and everybody knows I'm opinionated, whether you like me or hate me, I always tell you you got two choices, okay? You can listen and learn or you can turn me off and move on. That's your choice. I don't make you watch the videos. I don't make you listen to the podcast, right? And again, we have a lot of listeners, over 300,000 downloads to our podcast platforms every month. So you're obviously listening. So again, I'm very appreciative of that. Okay, back to the topic. So what we've got circulating around is an individual who has no originality in them at all, latched on to an expert who's maybe riding the coattails of their father. I'm not saying that being derogatory. I'm, I'm just saying, but they have to watch what they're saying because at the end of the day, they're making statements that make the National Electrical Code harder for people to understand or try to utilize. And that's the point, right? We're trying to figure out how to utilize this document. So you come to experts like me, um, and I loosely call myself an expert. I'm a code guy, but I'm an electrician. Whether you like it or not, I got the scars to prove it. I put my time in, okay? Just because I choose today to not work out in the trenches, hey, I like to call that progression, okay? Like Trump would say, if he didn't pay taxes, it's because he's smart. The system is made like it is, and he figured it out. With me, I learned that I had a knack for teaching. And I also work as a code expert for a large manufacturer that pound for pound probably produces more actual wire and cable than any other wire and cable manufacturer out there. They don't make tools. They don't make other things. They don't connect onto box manufacturers and cable man and uh, uh, cord man. All they make is wire and cable and they do it 24 seven, okay? So I'm the expert behind their codes and standards team, okay? That's where my passion is, right? Um, so at the end of the day, here's the deal. If you believe that something's wrong in the code, then fix it. Other than that, don't latch yourself onto people. Don't take a potential to drag yourself down and everybody else down because you want to rigidly support, uh, you rigidly want to a position in the code, which is really not founded. And there's other experts that, uh, and I'll point to one today that is well more knowledgeable than you would ever be and uh, probably more more knowledgeable than I'll ever be. And this is their interpretation that coincides with my interpretation that coincides with the code panel's interpretation, thus the changes in the code, okay? So that's what we're gonna look at today. Hopefully I cleared that all up before we get started, eight minutes in, and I gave you my intro. Hopefully you're on the edge of your seat, so we're gonna look at the code. So let's go to the code. Okay, so I did a video about researching the NEC, and I talked about uh, securing EMT, but this would apply to rigid, IMC, EMT. So we're just gonna use EMT as an example uh, in this scenario. Um, and so my position is back in 2008, a public input went in to require a support, let's say a strap, to physically be installed in a nipple or a short run Okay, of Raceway. So this was put into the code in 2008. It was submitted by a well-known educator who actually didn't submit it. Somebody submitted it for him. But anyway, it was in the code and it got it into the code and I'm okay with it. I would, if that's what it's in the code, I promote it and I would tell people that's what they need to do. But there was a well-known educator who also is a contractor who is well-known and submitted during that 2008 cycle, he says, look, you don't need to do this. We already have a practical uh, application here that every electrician does, and it's the common sense approach to it. Well, the code panels went with whatever the public input was, and it made it into the code. And that was requiring straps on any length of raceway, whether it was 18 inches, 6 inches, 12 inches, 18 inches, whatever. So that was in the 2008 National Electrical Code. Okay, so that individual that submitted that statement in the 2008, his name is Fred Hartwell. Very well-known individual, uh, and I met him a few times. He would never remember who I am. Um, but we see his stuff come in all the time on the code panels. Uh, we already know when it comes in that he's going to be well-substantiated. He's, you know, he knows his stuff, okay? Um, and if you don't know who he is, he also produces 
a for McGraw Hill, he produces their handbook, uh, which I like far better, to be honest with you, than the NEC's handbook. But again, both are great documents. I own them both. Um, Because I also, being a student of the code, want to see other people's interpretation. Ultimately, I make my own decision now, but I use history and I look things up to come up with these interpretations. And then I remember what the intent of the code is. It's a safety. If you want to go above the minimums, you do that. But at least has to be. So I have to think about that as a code person when I give advice out there. I have to remember how it's going to be done, how it's going to be installed, Um, and what are the ramifications behind that? So that's how I have to make an interpretation. However, if you want to go on a podcast or you want to go and you want to put out there, you're trying to teach people, but you start putting things out there that confuses them. Now they don't know what to do. And so they reach out to different people and they get mixed signals because you believe that yours is the only way to interpret this. Well, I'm going to shed some light on that today, just so you know. All right. So in 2011, it was submitted to remove the requirement for that uh, securely fashioned, say, a strap, in this case, within the three feet, okay? Because it says EMT shall be securely fastened in place at intervals not exceeding 10 feet. And then in addition, each EMT run uh, between termination points shall be securely fastened within three feet of each outlet box, junction box, device box, cabinet, conduit body, and other tubing termination. Okay. Now... Let's talk about this for a second. 2008 required the strap. Okay. It didn't consider the fittings as being securement, obviously. Um, So speed this to 2011. So 2011, another gentleman submitted a uh, public input to remove the strap for these, quote, nipple links, so these short runs. Uh, We don't have a definition of what a nipple is, um, per se. Um, But at the end of the day... It's still a conduit. It's still a raceway. So somebody submitted it and said, and they took what Fred said in 2008 and put it in their substantiation and added a little additional. Well, the code-making panel didn't agree with everything there. I guess it was a very long uh, submittal. But they obviously agreed with the premise that it is considered secured. Okay, Um, Why? Because they turned around and removed it From whatever was done in 2008, they removed it back to the language that was in 2005, prior to the change in 2008. And the point being was that if you have two cabinets and you have an EMT that's three feet between the cabinets, if that EMT is in a fitting and it's secured to the fitting and that fitting is secured to the cabinets, That is a complete run because it's a fitting on each end. So it's complete. So it meets the definition 300 of complete run. That's a complete EMT run. Okay. All right. So it says, again, in the code, it says, in addition, each EMT run, complete run, between termination points shall be securely fastened within three feet of each outlet box, junction box, device box, cabinet, conduit body, or other tubing termination. Okay, look, they want to hang their hat on the word within. So I'm going to, they're saying that, okay, so it needs, you don't include the fittings. It's just between the ends of the tubing termination. Okay, Um, so they want to stress. So they don't believe then that you can ever in the code have a raceway between terminations that would not require a strap. So then they say, well, I'm just, I'm just telling you what the code says. Okay. But they openly will tell you that they do not use a strap on their short runs between cabinets or junction boxes. Yet they tell you that's what the code says, but they don't do it themselves. And then they openly will say, well, it's because it's not a real world problem. It's a code language problem. I'm going to remind you something. This was 2011 when it was removed. We've since then gone through 2000. Oh, and by the way, you had a public comment stage that you could have fixed. Okay. Then you have a 2014 cycle, which didn't fix it. You have a 2017 cycle, didn't fix it. Two chances to fix it at each one of those, plus a nit man. Then you had the 2020 edition, you didn't fix it. So you got to ask yourself, is something broke or are you just playing semantics here? And let me give you some context. 
in the National Electrical Code, if we have MC cable and we're going from, and it's 330.30, if we're going from a connector down to a luminaire in a suspended ceiling, I'm allowed to go up to six feet, unsupported, okay? Unsupported, all right? It is considered secured and it is considered supported by the fitting at the box as well as at the luminaire, okay? So I can have up to six feet. But under this interpretation of the term within, in this statement in 358.30a, and of course this could also be applicable to uh, rigid and intermediate as well in their position here, that it requires the actual uh, strap to be within it, okay? All right, so that's the semantics they wanna throw out there. Look. If you really think that between two cabinets that are three feet apart, but to be honest with you, they believe that whether it's three feet or 24 inches or 18 inches or six inches, or to be honest with you, one inch, or maybe there's a chase nipple between it, I don't know, that they require that there actually be a strap in there or some type of securement method. Look, this is rigid. This is uh, rigid, uh, whether it's rigid pipe, intermediate, or EMT, this is a raceway. It's not non-flexible. It's not going anywhere. It is secured to the fittings. The fittings are secured to the box. That's a complete system. All right, so let's play semantics. Since the EMT slides into the fitting, the fitting overlaps it, maybe an inch, and secured to it, okay? So the moment that set screw secures to that EMT, guess what? it's fastened, it's securely fastened to that fitting. And oh, by the way, it's just inside the end of that tubing, so guess what? It's within the three feet. See, we can play semantics here. And what they'll tell you on their podcast, okay, with all their five viewers, or in, a, in their um, video that they're putting out to try to gain attention, what they won't tell you is that they want the within to negate the fittings at all. So here's my advice to you. You're telling every electrician out there that if I put in a 12 inch raceway between the two cabinets, okay? Now, when it comes to raceway fill, we've got some, we get some uh, guidance when it comes to nipples and what the rules are for that and all that kind of stuff, right? But look, when you're talking about this raceway, and you're literally gonna say, if it's 12 inches apart, I want every electrician out there to put a strap on it. Thinking that that raceway is literally gonna go anywhere. It's secured between two fixed cabinets, okay? That are required by code to be secured. A fitting that is set screwed to the EMT and then mechanically connected to the cabinets that that strap is going to do you any good. Now, they're going to say that this is not about the real world. This is about the NEC getting it changed. I'm going to remind you, where have you been? Okay, We're in 2023 coming up right now. Where is your public input? I'll remind you that the person that originally submitted it in 2008 has not come back and tried to get it changed, or at least it hasn't been substantiated enough that the code panel feels that it's got to change. Now, We'll see what happens in 2023. But here's the reality. A lot of people can opine about what they don't like. And that's okay. You have a right to that. You can disagree with anything in the NEC. But what you got to do is you got to put your money where your mouth is, right? So what you have to do is you literally have to do what? You have to submit public inputs to make change, right? You have to make change. Otherwise, all you're doing is just jabber jaw. That's all you're doing. And right now, certain individuals are doing that to just get attention, okay? So, and they do this by disrupting live streams. They do this by going on people's Facebook channels and posting stuff that is just way out there, not in reality. You gotta remember that we spend a lot of time when we're teaching people to try to simplify and make the code as simple as possible. And if you believe that that one word within changes the whole scope of this requiring a strap, and you think that that's gonna actually change anything or you think that is the intent, 
Well, you know, at the end of the day, then again, I eagerly await your public input. And then they turn around and say, but that's all I'm trying to do. I'm just, all I'm trying to do is help people understand the code the way it is. No, what you're doing is creating confusion for people because no matter how I spin this using your own method, I can say that that securement is within three feet, either however you slice it. But to think that I would have to put a strap on an 18 inch, a 12 inch, a six inch, far-fetched, okay? So in this rule, it allows me to go up to three feet, okay? And I have to secure that EMT within three feet. Well, guess what? It is secured at the fittings. Oh, and yeah, by the way, the fittings do overlap the actual tubing. So you know what? When the set screw goes down on it, that's the securement maybe. Is that within the three feet? Absolutely. We all can play semantics. I think what we all do know is that it is pointless, fruitless to actually put a strap on that piece of raceway. Now you can say, I'm just saying that's what the code says. Um, well, if you don't, we disagree. Now, with that said, let's go to a very popular opinion. Okay, so this is from the handbook uh, that's put out there by Mr. Hartwell. Great document. Um, again, for commentary purposes, I'm using this for the Fair Use Act. And let's look at the last paragraph, okay? And I will highlight it so that you can see what I'm, what I'm talking about is right here. I'm going to highlight this so that we're all clear on what we're talking about. Okay, right there. I'm going to highlight it so we can all see it. So we see what we're talking about. Here's what it says. It says, any nipple not over the general limit on the first point of support in length, namely three feet, is considered supported by its terminating hardware and no additional support is generally required. Now, I am sure that some people will play on the word generally. Reality is an AHJ can do whatever they want. But we have to use common sense, folks. This is the same folks, and this is the same guy who will say that service conductors can come into a building two feet, three feet, four feet. But when the code says that 230.70A1 says that they have to be in terminate outside or nearest point of entry... That literally would mean you have a meter and you have a panel and it goes straight through into the panel, right? Not going to be an issue in 2023 for one and two family, uh, 2020 for one and two family dwelling because you're required to have an emergency disconnect outside. So again, but that doesn't necessarily make that a feeder coming in. Still maybe service conductors depending on your options in 230.85, okay? But here's the point. You limit that length of service entrance conductor coming in because it's unprotected. It has overload protection inherent to the breaker that it terminates on, but it has no short circuit of ground fault protection. Some jurisdictions will let you go a foot, two foot, three feet, because it might be impractical to do it otherwise. But there are jurisdictions that say, nope, the code says it's got to either terminate outside or nearest point of entry. The moment that it comes through, the back, through that wall, it needs to go into a panel and hit a disconnect. Hey, you interpret that how you want. But that's an example of some people looking at the code and writing it. Got to remember that you're allowed to interpret it the way you want. The problem with this individual on his podcast or video, whatever they're doing now, is, and I'll remind you again, they never have their own opinion. They always play somebody else's opinion or bring somebody else on there. Kind of not really original, if you will. Um, and what happens is they'll turn around and tell you to do something, but then and openly will say they don't do something. So again, it's hypocritical. Again, you either do something or you don't. Um, I believe that my interpretation of 230.70A1 is if I was rigidly to enforce it, it says that it would have to come directly into the back of the cabinet. However, when I work for jurisdictions, I realized that there was cases where that was not practical. So we allowed them up to three feet. Okay, so we're limiting the length. Okay. That is my choice as an AHJ. That's what I choose. Okay, So at the end of the day, interpretation and what somebody allows is two different things. Right? Now, let's also look at the information that Mr. Hartwell states here. Because again, you can agree or disagree with Mr. Hartwell. All right? So I'm going to remove that. This. This is the statement. It says the special support limitations for conduit nipples imposed in the 2008 NEC have been revoked 
and the text returns to that of the 2005 NEC. Okay, again, that is the language from Mr. Hartwell. Whether you agree with it or disagree with it, that was the individual that submitted it in 2008. Ultimately, it was utilized by Mr. Carpenter in 2011 to get it removed. And this is his analysis and his handbook for the 2011 NEC when it comes to that application. I happen to agree with this position because it does not make any sense for a non-flexible raceway that is connected to fittings, that are connected to the uh, tubing, that is manually connected to the enclosure, that is considered a complete run, it is securely fastened, it is supported, nothing else is necessary. If you believe otherwise, or you believe that word within means so much, then you know what, I'm gonna hold you to count. I expect to see your input for the 2026 because I don't think you did it for the 2023, so I'm gonna hold you to it. We'll be checking on you to make sure you put it in there because you know what, electricians will laugh at you all over the country, ain't nobody putting a strap in there. What's the point? Is it gonna fall? It's sandwiched between fittings with set screws or compression and then connected to cabinets that are fashioned in place. They're fixed. <sighs> okay, whatever, you know? So anyway. So at the end of the day, a lot of people can try to get attention. I'm not into the attention. You can watch my videos or not watch my videos. You do what you want. But my goal is to try to give you solid interpretations, teach you to understand the code, and realize that it's a real world out there. There's a big difference between exams and the real world. I walk in both those worlds. I teach you how to pass an exam, the literalness of the code, and then I give you guidance on the application, remembering that the NEC is a safety document. And for you to say, or for the individual out there who's just trying to get attention, to say that I believe that you have to have a strap within the ends of that tubing based on the literalness of how he reads it, but then in an open Facebook say, yeah, but I don't do it. I don't do that because it's not a real world issue. It's just a code issue. Dude, where is your public input at? Look, I I'm there for you. If you get it in the code, I'll support you. But I don't believe it's necessary. And I think the code panel also doesn't believe it's necessary because it was removed in 2011. So again, hopefully you got something out of that. But at the end of the day, again, common sense has to rule the day. That document, the NEC, is hard enough as it is to read and understand. That's why you have folks like us out there trying to interpret it and make it easy as you can to understand. Not folks like you who want to make it complicated due to semantics, okay? And the same person that jumps on everybody because they say subpanel, knowing that it doesn't appear in the NEC. I think it appears once. But generally, it doesn't appear in the NEC, but we all know what it is. But for some reason, you get a hard-on jumping on everybody that says subpanel. Boy. Um, I think we all know what it is, so you might want to chill out a little bit on that. So till next time, folks, stay safe. God bless. And oh, by the way, go watch my video on researching the NEC, and you might learn something. Till next time, stay safe. God bless. Cheers.